I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. We'll talk with Duluth Mayor-elect Roger Reinert as he prepares to take office in January. We'll preview our new documentary, A Sea Change for Superior, which focuses on the impact of climate change on Lake Superior. And Heidi Holton from KAXE Radio in Grand Rapids is our guest this week on Voices of the Region. Those stories and another clip from the archives as Julie prepares for retirement up next on Almanac North. Hello once again everyone and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching and Julie here we are on the 1st of December. Very little snow and unusually mild temperatures. Yeah, I'm kind of excited about the prospect of an El Nino winter with uh, a little bit less than last year, but I, I'm hoping that we get some snow for the holidays. At this age, it's nice to shovel <laughs> less. <laughs> it is indeed. All right, let's get started with the headlines. All right. Thanks, Denny. This mild weather is holding back the ice fishing season and the Minnesota DNR is urging anglers to use extra caution before heading out on frozen lakes. The DNR says ice is never 100% safe, so you should always wear a life jacket or float coat when you venture out on the ice. As a general rule, ice should be at least four inches thick to be safe for walking and five to seven inches thick for a snowmobile. It's advised you carry an ice pick and check ice thickness frequently. Preliminary figures show the number of deer harvested during Wisconsin's firearms hunting season was down more than 17% from last year. Now in the northern forest hunting zone, about 15% fewer bucks and 27% fewer antlerless deer were harvested. Statewide, hunters registered about 174,000 deer during the gun hunting season. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz this week became the first governor in state history to visit all 11 tribal nations in the state. The governor and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan visited the Shakopee Metawakanton Sioux community Thursday to learn about tribal properties. Governor Walz says his administration is committed to working with and learning from the state's tribal governments. If visiting Duluth's Bentleyville holiday lighting display is on your wish list this season, the North Shore Scenic Railroad has an idea for you. If you want to avoid the crowded parking at Bayfront, you can leave your car at Fitgers and take the scenic train round trip to Bentleyville. The train runs every Thursday and Saturday night, and tickets are $10 at DuluthTrains.com. Duluth will have a new mayor in one month as voters elected a new city leader in November. The campaign signs have been collected and door knocking is behind and now the real hard work begins. Joining us to talk about the campaign and his transition to office is Roger Reinert, mayor-elect of the city of Duluth. And uh, mayor-elect, congratulations. Thank Good you. to have you here. No, thanks for having me. Um, and congratulations on your soon retirement. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about that too. Yeah. Uh, out with the old, in with the new. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, let's talk a little bit about the campaign and, and what you think are some of the factors that set you apart and really gave you an edge. In this well, case. you know, I think there were a couple of things that played. Um, one was folks were just ready for something different. And that was something that we heard really from one end of the community to the other. And sometimes people would say it differently. They might ha it might be about, you know, I just think a third term is too, too much. Um, some folks had specific issues that they were current. Um, concerned about, but for many it was just a sense that they wanted to see the community head in a different direction. And that coupled with, we really hadn't had a contested mayor election for mayor since um, 2007, and that was Don Ness and Charlie Bell. And we saw that, you know, as I did my homework to think about um, feeling called to this, you know, I looked at that history, and you know, four years ago, two-thirds of Duluthians didn't even vote in mm -hmm. the mayoral election. So, you know, as I reflect on the season we've just ended, one of the things that I'm incredibly proud of is that we saw almost 54% mm -hmm. voter turnout. Some states in presidential elections don't see that kind of a voter mm -hmm. turnout. Mm -hmm. So now, what's it like putting a team together? Sure. You know, I, I think uh, folks always ask, like, what is it that the mayor, you know, where do, where do your hands show up, I guess? And all the department directors are mayoral appointees, the police chief, the fire chief, the human rights officer, mm -hmm. um, the city administrator, and the city attorney. And then the mayor also has two staff that directly um, work with them, a communications person as well as a community outreach officer. So 
I've been busy. Um, Julie and I were chatting before the show. You know, I, I still have my other jobs that people are paying <laughs> me for until this one starts. So on top of that, I've been busy uh, just getting a chance to sit with many of those folks one on one and sort of make those um, evaluations uh, like who is who are the right folks to be in the team mm -hmm. um, to join me as we move forward after January 2nd. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you served on the Duluth City Council sure. um, years ago. Does yeah. that familiarity with the departments and with the procedures in the city kind of help you as you start think, putting things together? I think so, and of course it's not exactly the same, and it's not even exactly the same as when I was in the legislature, which was uh, you know um, a half a dozen years ago. But definitely the process is familiar, so the rhythms are familiar. Um, and coming off the council, I think I really have a respect for the role that the council plays. You know, it's like Congress to the president uh, at the local level. And so I've also started meeting with counselors and counselor elects one on one just to build that relationship, talk about what their agenda is in 2024, what my interests are, where we see overlap, where we might have differences. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, communication and being honest about the, those things is a great way for us to start. Do you have any initial goals, Roger, in your first few months of office? Well, you know, Denny, I think that first 100 always seems like a magic <laughs> number. I'm convinced it's only magic because we say it is. Um, but, you know, as I've met with those city, uh, current city staff leaders, I've really said two things. Number one, you know, when I'm in office and that first week is going to be spent circling back to all those folks again, I want you to talk to me about a couple wins in your area that we can get out of the gate right away that show the community we heard these five big issues we talked about during the campaign and this theme of we really want the city to do city things again, to really focus on core city services. We want to demonstrate that to our taxpayers right away. And then the second thing is I'm really interested with my team of looking at the structure in City Hall where do we have our alignment of both our human and our fiscal resources and are they aligned to those core city services that we've promised we're going to deliver so kind of both short and uh, a longer term goals and i would share i do plan to do a state of the city at about that 100 day mark i'm hoping to do it out at denfeld high school in the auditorium and uh, have people do something a little bit different mm -hmm. than what we've normally done with the deck and come to one of our really historic assets in the western part of our community mm -hmm. of course you'll be um mayor of the entire city, but there right. were parts of the city that uh, leaned toward Mayor Larson. Sure. Yeah. The UMD area, the East the Hillside, East Hillside yeah. downtown waterfront. Yep. Um, are there special things that you're going to do to reach out to voters in those areas to try to get them on board the Roger train? Well, <laughs> I don't want to ride the Roger train. Um, no, I think it is, you know, my attitude is, and I said this the, the night of the election, you know, I am mayor for all of Duluth. Uh, and I've had plenty of meetings already with folks that I that I know didn't support me, and that's okay. Um, you know, there's a few cases where it's going to take more work to rebuild some relationships, just because of the you know at times this campaign was was uh, was challenging. I'll I'll say that. But for most, you know, this is the product of having a couple well-qualified candidates. You will have people make different choices, and I'm okay with that. Um, and I don't take that personally. So, you know, the mayor for all of the community means that, we're, that I treat all of the community the same. And I'm not looking to try to do one thing for a group of people um, mm -hmm. than I would for another. And part of that is I'm not, I don't have an eye towards four years from now. I've been asked to serve at this time. Um, and, you know, three or four years from now, we'll make an assessment of whether I feel called and whether the community thinks that I would be the right fit. But that's not the work we're doing now. The work we're doing now is to align the staff and resources to our core city services. And as you look ahead, Roger, how strong is Duluth economically? We're doing well, but we could do better, certainly. You know, and one of the things we talked about during the campaign was how important it is to grow our commercial tax base, to grow our, the right. business part of our community. You know, Denny, we're seeing population growth <coughs> in the region. We're not seeing it in the city. So we really have a twofold challenge. And one is to dispel that myth that we're a difficult place to do business. But the other, and it's, it's so intertwined, is to have that mid-market housing so that as our employers try to recruit, as they try to grow, those employees have a place to live within our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting back to uh, you know, rebuilding and building relationships, you served many years in the state legislature mm -hmm. as uh, a member of the DFL party. Yeah. You chose not to seek the DFL right. endorsement in the mayor's race, but it was given to, to Emily Larson. Sure. Um, are there repairs that need to be made oh, certainly. there in yeah. terms of kind of bringing 
bringing yourself back into the fold? Well, and I would say a couple of things. That's a great question. Um, and, and really nothing to do around the endorsement. I made an intentional decision about not seeking political party and honoring the nonpartisan nature of the role. And, you know, as you know and many know, I think I was endorsed five times as a, as a DFL candidate. Um, much more to do with the again the turn the campaign took and you know the there were nine different attack mailers uh, from a group that that supported me at one time and I was a member of it at did the that Capitol. surprise you it did and it really disappointed me you uh -huh. know and it it disappointed me both because of that nature but also because of you know the DC tactic of I'm going to take this one thing that was a committee vote on an a5 amendment and offer it as proof of everything and you know, I'm so thankful, and I really did believe that local is where that we can uh, overcome those styles of time because people know you and they've yeah. seen your service. So what I'll say is, um, I come into office knowing that I owe this election to one group of people, and that's everyday Duluth voters. Because of course, you, in addition to not doing party endorsements, we didn't seek elected official endorsements, we didn't seek a laundry list of union endorsements. We really were just focused on on folks, and we saw that again in that 54% voter turnout. You did a lot of one-on-one -on -one campaigning. I sure did. <laughs> what did you learn from the voters as you knocked on doors? Uh, you know, uh, and it really started last spring right away. We really were intentional about our first phase of the campaign being listening. So we had coffee conversations, <coughs> and we had small groups, and I. I can't tell you how many one-on-ones I did. And largely I just listened and I took notes. And out of that came those five big issues then we talked about, the housing and the commercial tax base mm -hmm. and streets and downtown. Um, and those then are, I consider our marching orders as we, we move through. You know, when you look at not just uh, uh, almost record voter turnout, we haven't seen it in, in many, many years, that 54%, but also the 20% vote margin. I mean, it really, I didn't need a poll. I mean, that told me that not only were we right on the issues, but that the public was saying, get after it. This is what we want to see progress on. Mm -hmm. You've had a, a lot of life experience yeah. since the last time you were in public office. <laughs> True story, yeah. <laughs> you earned your law degree. You've yeah. been working as a lawyer. Went to Afghanistan. Um, you've been deployed a number yeah. of times as a yeah. naval reservist. You've been teaching at the college. Yeah. Are you a different person oh my today gosh, yes. coming in, coming oh, into office with, such, yeah. with different perspectives? That's such a great question. And I think, you know, I look back and, you know, spending a year in combat uh, in Afghanistan, coming back home and going through a really difficult personal chapter, as many veterans do after that kind of experience. You know, if you would have asked me three years ago if I'd ever be sitting here having this, <laughs> like, no, no. I didn't even know if I was still going to be in the Navy after that. And, but yet those things were so formative. You know, even in the most difficult parts of the campaign, I was able to say to myself, I've been through worse. Like, no one's shooting at me. <laughs> like, this is not, this is hard emotionally, but it's not dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it really does set a different um, met uh, metric and level for um, what is hard and what is challenging. And I think those, uh, the, the really, the number one thing that those experiences taught me was humility. And it's something that even as I move into this role, I keep saying to folks, like, if you've known me for more than a year, use, the, use my name and not the title. Because <laughs> I want to be the person doing the thing and don't ever want to become the thing. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, Roger, good Thank to you see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thank Thanks you, Roger. for coming Thanks, in. Thanks, Teddy. You bet. You bet. <laughs>
three or four different things out there and they start to accumulate. It's a petty misdemeanor now to, uh, to leave any kind of trash or anything, anything that you bring out on the ice with you, including if it's the entrails from the fish that you catch or it, basically let's just say anything, including if it was inside of your body when you brought it out there. Itasca County is kind of unique in the state of Minnesota. IM Care is the sole carrier of public health insurance. In September, IM Care announced plans to terminate its in-network contract with Lakeview Behavioral Health by the end of the year. That change could impact about 700 patients that are receiving treatment at Lakeview Behavioral Health. The county says that it is following a transition plan approved by the state and is working with those affected to seek appropriate care elsewhere. But many residents have tried working with county officials only to be told that the matter isn't public information. We talked recently with Simon Gretton. He's a local EMT. Well, that's been very frustrating with this. That really has. I mean, I've been, uh, you know, naturally you hear about something like this. You reach out to the county commissioners. That's what we do. They're the ones who are accountable for. Unfortunately, their position has been that they can't comment on this. They've they've cited legal concerns. And that's been, you know, I, I certainly don't want to accuse anyone of acting in in bad faith and i'm not going to i'm going to assume they're acting in good faith but it's really been frustrating to have a conversation about this i think generally we are considered to be an, an underserved area generally and it's uh, it's not hard to imagine that if this happens that we'll see increases in homelessness increases in people using the er increases in people calling the ambulance increases in people calling law enforcement, you know, maybe more suicides, maybe more murders, all the things that we don't want to see. We just finished a week-long celebration of 40 years of phonology on KAXC. Phonology is about nature. It's about the noting what's different in nature due to seasons. And we have over 18 classrooms throughout the state of Minnesota that contribute to this program. They wanted John to know how inspired they were by the work that he has done. And in the end, we got inspired by them. Here is a crowdsourced poem that was written by fifth grade students in Northfield. I never noticed how fawns jump, fox kids play, a bald eagle perches. Pink color hits. A murmuration of birds cover the sky and a flapping of wings. I'm mesmerized. Excited to watch. Sometimes the littlest things are best. Noticing the clouds. The wildflower in my backyard. The changing leaves. The hidden mushroom. The birds singing their usual song. My backyard holds generations. All the little things gather into one big thing, a season. When I was small, I didn't notice. Now I ask questions. I pay attention. I look delicately. I welcome the spring's first heron. I say goodbye to the fall's last dragonfly. I have a whole new way to see the world. A Sea Change for Superior is the new collaborative documentary between Hamlin University and PBS North. The documentary explores the legacy of the world's largest freshwater lake at a time of exceptional change. Megan McGarvey sat down with one of the producers of the film to learn more. The story really started with our um, learning about the fact that Lake Superior is among the fastest warming of the large lakes of the world. And uh, we <clears throat> have been doing educational work, interpretive work uh, about uh, natural and cultural history along uh, Lake Superior's North Shore, uh, developing educational resources and documentary videos. And then uh, that just became a really interesting 
fact. And what does that mean? What does that mean for the natural systems of a lake that is famously frigid? And uh, what does it mean for the legacy of Lake Superior as this fabulously cold lake? One of the things we wanted to do is really uh, convey a sense of, you know, what's Lake Superior like? What makes it special? You know, the clarity of the water, just the, the size of the lake and, you know, places you can look out and it's, you know, it's, there's no horizon. It goes on forever. Um, you know, it can be incredibly calm and in those, especially those, you know, weeks in the latter part of the summer, a lot of times it's very calm, but huge storms. And, you know, so how do you capture all that? Um, and it's challenging. And, and one of the things we did was um, we engaged uh, Christian Dahlbeck as an underwater photographer. So we spent some time working with him to get some, some of his images of what's the, what does it look like under the waves? You know, what's distinctive about that? We uh, got out on research vessels uh, of, with some of the scientists that are doing this research to try and studying the lake, understanding uh, how it operates and, and how it's changing. So that kind of provides a perspective, you know, being on a fairly large ship out on the lake um, uh, and then you know but it's it's not an easy thing to do because it's huge and you know in the winter you know the winter turns out to be a very important season for um, productivity of biological productivity in the lake and uh, we're getting less and less ice uh, you know due to the warming climate and that has had impact so you know how do you capture the lake in winter, it's not, you know, it, you can't always get out or, you know, it's, there is less ice, so there's less opportunity to be out there. So, so there were definitely challenges there. And we just, you know, uh, tried to uh, think outside the box of finding ways to capture those kind of images. Um, the work I do with Hamlin University at our Center for Global Environmental Education is really focused on um, uh, helping people become environmentally literate, understanding how natural systems around us work that are so important for sustaining our lives, um, and stewardship, the idea of, you know, we're here to, um, as human beings, you know, that's part of what it means to be a human being is to take care of the world around us. The documentary itself, when it's all done, um, will be broadcast here on PBS North and then eventually released to other PBS stations in Minnesota and then beyond Minnesota, you know, through the PBS network. So uh, I would say a primary goal is like people being able to kind of more deeply appreciate what's valuable and important about Lake Superior. And then to understand that it's changing and um, that, uh, you know, the, the changes are resulting from human activity. And so what can we do to mitigate those changes to reduce their impacts and um, so our goal ultimately is to you know kind of heighten that awareness and lead people toward um, being doing what they can to have an impact on on these issues A Sea Change for Superior will have its broadcast premiere this coming Monday, December 4th at 7 p.m. on PBS North. And as we mentioned on a previous show, Julie is stepping down from Almanac North after 30 years of hosting the program. And as we get ready for our last show together on December the 15th, we thought it would be fun to share some highlights from Julie's career over the next few weeks. Now, the clip you're about to see is from 2007, when Julie and former Almanac North host Darren Danielson talked with two former Duluth mayors about Don Ness's run for their old job. Let's take a look. Well, candidates Don Ness and Charlie Bell have made it past the first hurdle to becoming the next mayor of Duluth. As the top two vote getters in Tuesday's primary election, the next month and a half will be critical to the candidates. And who better to talk about what comes next than two former mayors of Duluth? Joining us now is Gary Doty, who served 12 years in the mayor's office. And John Fido was mayor of Duluth during the 1980s and the early 90s. And thanks to both of you gentlemen for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for inviting us. Now, much ado has been made about the, the youth of Don Ness, um, but mm -hmm. I think that you need to set the record straight because you... <laughs> <laughs> right here and now, John. Right you were now. the youngest city councilor, I understand. Uh, I, yes, and the youngest yes, mayor. yes. I, How old uh, were you when you were first elected to city council? It was a long, long time. I can tell by the gray hair. <laughs> Actually, I was, uh, I was 24 when I was elected to council and uh, 
29 when I took office, 28 when I ran for mayor, but 29 when I took office as mayor. So, so is youth an advantage or a disadvantage in, well, <laughs> in the position? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in, in one context, youth, uh, I think, brings a, a level of exuberance that nothing is unreachable. Uh, I think that in and of itself helped me get to the point of saying, let's try a number of these new ideas. Uh, and I think that that has uh, a benefit. But uh, on the opposite side to that experience also, uh, as you go along, you learn you know, how these great ideas can be adapted. And so there's a balance there that needs to be struck. We were over our time 30 seconds ago, but Gary, you have final word. Well, final November word 6th is, of the election. Is, is, is John and I, John and I are no hanging in City Hall together. <laughs> yeah. and I don't know if that's not like hanging, hanging in City Hall. We are not hanging around. Side by uh, side. We're side by side and, and uh, literally uh, on the pillars holding yeah, there. Yeah. That's just scary. It, it is, is fun to be back here. Uh, is, have us back again, would you? I will. It yeah. was great to have you both here. We and enjoyed honestly, it. Honestly, thank, thank you thank very you. much thank for you. being here. and uh, It's a, a, a pleasure and come back again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you both. You know, the first thing I think when I see that is that those set panels are in my outhouse at our cabin. Really? So <laughs> <laughs> I still see them every day. They, Very familiar. They gifted to me. you with the old. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, uh, you know, how fast time flies yeah. because, you know, both of us have been in the news business for a long time. Both of us were in the news business through the, the John Fido and right. the Gary Doty right. administrations. Now we're 16 years and two mayors later, and we're introducing Roger and. It's, uh, Time flies. it's just interesting. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway. All right. Thank you. Well, with Julie Zenner, I'm Dennis <laughs> Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.